So, we've been going through, we've been going through the laws of Nitzlat today. We're in Siman Dalit in the fourth chapter, 53. And so we know that we we're supposed to wash our hands in the morning. We found the source for this is in the Gemara. But we didn't yet see in the Gemara a reason for why is it that we wash our hands in the morning for Tilat Day. Actually, we see too many. Oh. <laughs> After this, we saw way too many reasons for this. There are many I can ask you to sit here and share a book with... Uh, here, here. What's the next time we'll share a book? So says Rabbi David Yosef, there are five reasons. Five reasons for why we wash our hands in the morning. And the problem is that every one on its own is not good enough because there are times where one reason will apply and times where it won't apply. So, the first reason we said it was based on the Zohar. The reason we wash our hands in the morning, according to the Zohar, is because when a person goes to sleep at night, their neshama leaves their body, and their hands receive a certain ruach ra'a, an evil spirit. And the only way to remove this ruach ra'a is by washing the tilat edayim, washing our hands in the morning. The second reason was found in the Gemara, what did it say? That the night time, so long as night passes over you, it causes for a ruach ra'a to happen, and you have to wash your hands. What was the difference between the Zohar and the Talmud? Sleeping at night. I mean, according to the Talmud, even if you don't sleep at night, the fact that you experienced a night time is enough to make you wash your hands. But according to the Zohar, you actually have to go to sleep. And it could be that according to the Zohar, it could be, it's just, I'm saying could be, that according to the Zohar, if you sleep during the day, then you have to wash your hands. Whereas according to the Talmud, no, you just it has nothing to do with sleeping and everything to do with the night time. The fan is running really... So, we saw a third reason, the Rosh. The Rosh. The Rosh says, the reason we wash our hands in the morning is because... Because our, our hands touch places in our body. They touch everywhere when we sleep. And therefore when they touch our body, they become unclean, and we have to wash our hands in the morning. According to the Rashba, according to the Rashba, Rabbi Shlomo ben Aderet, thank you very much for Yosef for looking that up for us yesterday. The Rashba says the reason we wash our hands in the morning, because we're a new being, we're a new creation in the morning. And therefore we want to find an opportunity to say thank you, I will give you extra credit points if you do research over this next week and find out for us why it is specifically in the Tilat Yadayim that is a good way to say thank you to HaKadosh Baruch I remember once finding something like this in the Mishnah Bawa, but I don't remember what it was that he said. If you give me a second, I'm going to look it up. One second. Uh, can you get me Mishnah Bawa from now? Just put it kind of kind of. No. I the spare book for um, the Rockos? We have, we, have a, we have a spare Shulchan Aruch for... No, we don't. Oh, we just sold the last one? No, a spare to sell. Yeah, we do have an extra one at my house, though. Oh, it's your house. Not yeah, your house. I'd have to know to bring it. Thank you, Don. I'm um, you know, you have one here for a little while, but I guess somebody picked no, it up. No, they're, they're using it. The... Oh, they got it. Okay. <laughs> I don't know about the, uh, the stock right now. Maybe the drone does. We'll have to check tomorrow. We can order. We got the store where uh, Zev worked on our store for a while, yeah. <laughs> um, Back in the day. I'm, I'm going to be the Masada Kedusha at a wedding. <laughs> and I'm looking for the two you guys a lot, a lot of you. Use the Nusach that I do. Which Nusach? He's a Spartak Nusach. I don't have a Spartak, it's just... Because I, I, I brought one from Eretz Yisrael, but my Rosh Hashiva said it's not good because the Nusach that they use in Rabbanu has some specific things for Israel. Mm-hmm. He has the right one. 
We, we know how to do it. Huh? Yeah? Okay. Yeah, so just come there and just pick your art, and then Denise will tell you whether so it's... So they don't want the... Yeah. Yeah. Okay, listen, the Rashba, I'm looking inside of him. He doesn't seem to give us a good enough reason for why in the At least not in my preliminary glance over here at the Rashba. I saw you looking at the Rashba yesterday. No, you look at the Rosh yesterday, right? Do you have the Rashba? No, I wouldn't have them here. That's why I was wondering where you looked. Rosh. Um, interesting. It seems to be the Rashba, according to the understanding of the Chavetz Chaim, is telling us that when a person wakes up in the morning, all of the brachot we make in the morning, all those brachot we make are brachot hashevach. They're, they're thank you, Nakadosh Baruch Hu. And one of the brachot hashevach, thank you, Nakadosh Baruch Hu, is on Tilat Yedayim. Even though the language of the bracha has nothing to do with thanking Hashem, but we found the first thing we could do in the morning that are able to make a bracha. And he seems to attach all of these things together. It could be that according to him, just making brachot in the morning is a way to say thank you, Nakadosh Baruch Hu. Interesting. Okay, that's the Rashba. The fifth reason was from the Abu Draham or the Abu Derham, depending however you want to pronounce his word. Rabbi David says... The reason being, Kohanim wash their hands. the Kohanim, very nice, wash their hands in the morning, and therefore we wash our hands also like the Kohanim, wash their hands in the morning. There will be differences between these opinions, but we're not there yet. So, let's see in the bottom of page 53, where it says Bet, you see where it says Bet over there, the bottom of page 53? Yeah. A person's actions before washing his hands for shacharit. Meaning, what is it that we're allowed to do before we wash our hands for shacharit? Can you share with Zev and some drones? Well, we, we, we got that part. You guys cut off. There you go. It's all set. It's all set for you. You got it. Now I see it. So, Zev, can you share with him the book? Okay. So, Things that we know we need to do, like modani, fine, we got it. But what are we allowed to do? But I mean, how soon to waking up do we have to wash our hands? Pretty soon. It's a trick question, because most of us... I'll tell you what happens today with Jewish customs. Jewish customs, we do whatever people do, but we don't know where it comes from. So we do something thinking that this must be the right way to do it. And then we realize, hey, maybe the source for this isn't so old. Maybe Jews only started doing this 100 years ago. I'll give you an example. Going to the mikveh before praying shacharit. There are certain Jewish communities where if you don't go to the mikveh before you pray shacharit, you might as well not be Jewish, right? And in their community, you hear somebody doesn't go to the mikveh, that's like somebody who doesn't wear tefillin. And it's true that in that community, it's very important to go to the mikveh. It's true that going to the mikveh has very much value. But the question is, how old is that custom? The custom of going to the mikveh before shacharit, anybody know when it was started? No. Breast soccer. Breast I think most chasiduyot. Go to the mikveh before shacharit. About two thousand years ago, so it used to be, it used to be that we were very careful about the laws of tuma and tara, being pure and impure. And there are things that happen at night that can make a person impure. And therefore, Ezra said, "Let's make an Ezra." You know the famous Ezra from the Tanakh says, "I'm making a decree, a takana. People should go to the mikveh before they pray." And uh, the rabbis got rid of Ezra's decree. Because in Gozrim Gzera la Tzibur, you are forbidden to make a decree on the community, Asher Ena Tzibur Echol Amodba, which the community is unable to uphold. It's too much. It's hard enough to get out of bed to pray, then get out of bed to go to the mikveh, then to go to pray. How much can you expect from a community? Was there also the decree from Ezra on you know, marital relations going to the mikveh after? Yes, yeah, it's, well. it's the same decree. It's the same decree. Interesting. How, so how they come together? One's connected to Fila, one's connected Because to one the happens at night and Fila happens in the morning. So it would be oh, right after that, okay, you would be going okay. to the Mi'kvah. Okay. Now, the idea is that even though the rabbis got rid of the decree, there seems to be this extra piety would be to still do what Ezra said. Absolutely. And that's why you found throughout our generations, the Kabbalists, or people who were very holy, they used to go to the Mi'kvah before they prayed. 
So there's nothing wrong with going to the mikvah before you pray. The rabbis got rid of it. Doesn't mean the rabbis forbade it. Rather, they said it's not necessary. And therefore, when you weigh things, by the way, if the, if the Jewish world would consider this law, this rule, it's a halakha, you cannot decree things in the community that the community is unable to uphold. This would would drastically transform the way we look at halakha. It doesn't mean we say, oh, you know, sorry, we can't keep Shabbat anymore, let's get rid of Shabbat. Nobody's saying that, that's not, what, that's not how you use the law. Rather, the rule is, I, I now want to come and make a new halakha, I have to, a new thing came up, you have to very much take the community's ability into consideration. As a leader of a community, as one who's writing rules for a community, you have to know what are they able to do, and what are they unable to do. And therefore... If people were to take this rule into consideration, much of the problems that we have in the Jewish community today, we wouldn't have. It's like because what? You have to know what medicine the patient uh, can take. The Rambam oh. loves this example. The Rambam always says that you know some sick people need medication, but a person who's healthy shouldn't be taking medication. You know, it works for somebody who's sick, but the person who's healthy is only going to get hurt by taking medication. Says the Rambam, sometimes you'll find things that are prohibited to keep a certain group of people in line. He said, but they're sick. That's why they need this kind of medication. The other people are healthy, so why do you have to impose the medication from that group on this group? Yeah? It's something to think about. Just an idea. So our rabbis tell us that, okay, you don't have to go to the mikveh. So I want to go to the mikveh. Fine. So the holy tzaddikim, the Kabbalists, they went to the mikveh throughout the generations. And when the rabbi Yisrael Baal Shem Tov, the founder of the Hasidic movement, uh, started the Hasidic movement. As you know, the word Hasid means not a guy with a fuzzy hat. The word Hasid means righteous. a righteous person. Pious, yeah. I mean, technically, you can't be a Hasid until you're pious. I mean, you can't be born a Hasid. It's a, it's a modern it's a day, it's a, it's a modern day invention that you can be born Hasidic. That's like being born, you know, a Tzaddik. You can't be born a Tzaddik. You have to become a Tzaddik. It's one of those things that we have to redefine. But today you'll find people, they call themselves Hasidim, but they're the furthest thing from being righteous. And they have to, they have to balance it. You have people who are not Hasidim at all, and they're exceptionally righteous. So we have to make sure we use the word properly. When I say Hasid here, I don't mean righteous people. I mean the movement of Hasidim. Part of his movement was, I want to push people to the height of their righteousness. I don't want them just to stick to Halakha. I want them to do extra things. And part of that extra was going to the mikveh every morning. And that's wonderful. That's wonderful. But let me tell you, what if a guy says, listen, I'm 15 years old. I barely make it out of bed for davening. So now if you're going to make me go to the mikveh, I'm definitely not going to wake up. Because I don't have enough spiritual, emotional strength to get out of bed, to go to the mikveh, to go to shachri. So if you would force him to go to the mikveh, you might be stopping him from waking up at all. What if a person says, you know, I go to the mikveh, that's why I come late to davening. <clears throat> How does that help? Hare, the mikveh you don't have to do. It's a good thing to do. It's a good thing to do, T- two hours before davening. Not two hours into davening. <laughs> Those people, you see that at the end of tefillah, they come back with a towel on their shoulder. They were in the mikveh. Wonderful. I also went to the swimming pool before shakri. It doesn't mean, doesn't mean they were supposed to hang out there through all tefillah. Like, there are things that are more important. You must first do what you are what you have to do, what you're obligated to do, only then do the extras. I'll tell you a famous story. Our parents was once in the mikveh. I wasn't there with him. Our parents was once in the mikveh, and he was uh, leaving the mikveh. Our parents prays every single day at nets, at sunrise. According to the Shulchan Aruch, you have to pray net, shachrit with the sunrise. One who doesn't pray shachrit with the sunrise has, after the fact, a certain amount of time to pray afterwards. So he prays every morning with Netzachama. And it's been maybe, he told me, 36 years. He hasn't missed Whoa. a tefillah at Netzachama. <coughs> wow. So he was getting out of the mikveh. And you know, he's right, he's three minutes left on the clock to make it to Bethkanesa to pray at Netz. And as he's leaving, he sees this guy. He happened to be Breslov. I'm giving it the shevach. He was awake. At, you know what time this is? Five o'clock. So he was up at four thirty, already getting ready for tefillah. I'm giving it the shevach to him. He was coming to the mikveh, and our parents said, "Stop." He said, "The bigger mitzvah now is to pray with nets, not to go to the mikveh." He says, "Why don't you first go to nets with me, and then you'll go to the mikveh afterwards?" He said, "Oh, you know, you have to go before you pray." He said, "But you don't understand. It's more important to pray with sunrise than it is to go to the mikveh." And he thought about it for a moment. And ever since then, he goes to the mikveh earlier. That way he's able to make it a Nezachama. 
You have to calculate things. What's more important, what's less important. The same thing is with washing our hands. We grew up in a world where we see many people, they keep a, a basin of water next to their bed. So we're already ingrained in our mind that a person must, must wash their hands the second they get out of bed. The question is, is that true halachically? Is it true halachically? Or is it an extra level of piety that we're already so used to that we can't even bear to think about the other, the other option? Shalom, shalom. <laughs> so, says Rabbi David Yosef, Mutang lil bosh b'gadav, a person is allowed to get dressed, to wear his clothes. Call them before, nitilat yadaim, washing your hands, shacharit in the morning. You are allowed to get out of your bed, go find your shirt, your tzitzit, your pants, your socks, get dressed, and then wash your hands in the morning. Didn't we say, I think if you see my name before, that you should like, some related to topic, like you shouldn't take clothes from someone who didn't wash their hands yet. Oh, that's a good point. It seems to be that piece of Gemara, when we looked it up, didn't make much sense. It has to do something with Shin Dalits, with all kinds of uh, creepy beings, and specifically to do with taking from somebody else, but not yourself. Because over there, he said you should take it from yourself. Don't let other someone else who didn't do that. Have it could be that that's interesting. You know, if you were dead to the rest of your kids, but that'd be okay. But let's first deal with Shkoch. That's a good memory. Yeah, so follow on question of that. So suppose you have a baby and, you know, you have to feed him or... So we're, we're going to talk about that. Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. It's a good question because that's the same... What you're doing is you're saying his thing in a practical example. Mm-hmm. I mean, today we don't necessarily have people that get us dressed, but we definitely dress up other people and they're like our kids. So therefore... Now, this, this is a valid question. We're going to deal with it when it comes up. Says Rabbi David Yosef, Halakhically, you are allowed to get dressed before you wash your hands. Vamachmir baze, and one who is strict in this regard, meaning he doesn't get dressed until... He washes his hands. He washes his hands. Now, doesn't get dressed means he's still wearing... Nightgown. At the very least, something that he's tsanuayin. You can't you know, walk around the house not dressed at all. I live in an apartment building, so sometimes... Hashem should save us from what I have to look out of my windows. You know, people have to be careful when they get dressed in their house. And that person has to think. So, when a person, he's allowed to wait until he washes his hands, obviously assuming that he's wearing something that's, uh, that's tsenua. V'amechemir, but the one who's strict about it, tava he will receive an extra blessing. Is this the first time we've ever bumped into this term in halacha? You're back. Is this the first time we bumped into this term? One who is strict will receive an extra blessing? Yeah, yeah I don't remember. F- I mean, I learned so from it, like but I don't remember so far in Rabbi David Yosef that we've seen this. This is a very frustrating term in Halakha. Well, this thing, I do, it's praiseworthy, is that how it's usually translated. Right. It's praiseworthy if you do this. If you do this. But when or who or how, it's like... You know, it's I'll tell you why this frustrates people. Because in a world where we want halakha to be black and white, you suddenly just threw a gray in there. But not just gray, a very shiny, sparkly, attractive gray that's more like a silver. Like, oh, I want to be praiseworthy. I want to do this, of course. But it's, it's kind of like saying, okay, um, I, I stop at a red light but I stay stopped for another 15 seconds after it turns green. Even though you're allowed to go when it's green. It's kind of... Not necessarily. Let me give you a better example. (laughs) What if we would say, you're allowed to make a right on red, but one who is praiseworthy does not make a right on red. In California, you'd upset the person behind you. (laughs) Right, of course. But in most places, they would consider that safe, because when you make a right on red, you're putting your life in danger. That's what it would be more similar to. So why in the world would I stay at the stoplight if I'm allowed to make a right on red? Am I allowed to make a right on red? Am I not allowed to make a right on red? If I'm allowed to make a right on red, if I'm allowed to, then why are you telling me it's praiseworthy not to? If I'm allowed to get dressed before I wash my hands, why are you telling me it's praiseworthy not to? And if it's praiseworthy not to, then why isn't that the halakha? So you had said... The principles of Allah oh. said that there's merit in starting strict, 
so as to have a fence, but then to grow in knowledge and to become lenient when the Shokana Aruk demands it and when we're expert. Oh, beautiful. So we didn't mention here who is it praiseworthy for. Perhaps it's praiseworthy either one for the person who doesn't know so much and we don't want him to mess up, or it could be the other extreme. Praiseworthy, thank you. Praiseworthy for a person who's on a very high level. But you and I, I don't know, maybe you, not me, we're not there yet. And I've said this, I don't know how many times I've said this in my classes, but please say it to other people. I know it sounds much worse than it actually is. Judaism is not a democracy. I'll tell you very simply what I mean. Judaism is in a democracy, you can do whatever you want. You can do whatever you want, however you want, as long as you're not hurting somebody else. In Judaism, we have a very strict order of what you're allowed to do, what you're not allowed to do. There are things that are good to do, but you're not allowed to do them unless you reach a certain place of holiness. Because if you jump the gun, I think we spoke about this on Shavuot, right? With Rabbeinu Tam and those kind of things. If you jump the gun, what you're saying is, I'm holier than other people, but you're really not, so you're a liar. So you think you're extra holy than other people. You're doing actions that would make someone else feel inferior to you, but they're actually not inferior to you, in which case, Judaism is not a democracy because you're not allowed to do that. There's a very clear path to when you are allowed to be more stringent. But let's assume for the sake of this discussion, we're not even talking about the extra pious person. Rather, Rabbi David Yosef is using what I call modern halachic lingo. If it's allowed, it's allowed. If it's not allowed, it's not allowed. Hamachmir Tavala Avbacha is a new word to say. You know, so many people don't do it, and they have a valid source. That even though halacha says you can do it, there's one opinion that says you shouldn't, or a few opinions that says you shouldn't. Okay, you're, you're allowed to be stringent. Meaning, meaning, there are times where you are not allowed to be strict. Oh, very nice. This is what you have to see. You're only allowed to be strict when he tells you it's a good thing to be strict. But if there are two opinions, and he says the halakha is like the lenient one, you're not allowed to be strict in that regard. Unless you see this code word. Hamachmir, one who is stringent, is praiseworthy. In which case, he's giving you the green light that in this situation, you're allowed to take the high road. Yeah? What does it mean to be extra pious? That's a fabulous question. What, what that would do is have to take something that's unquantifiable and quantify. Piety is a hard thing pregnancy? to measure. I mean, you're pregnant or you're not a woman. <laughs> Can it be half pregnant? You're pious or not pious? It's not... <laughs> right, so it's it's not it's not like are you a human or are you not a human. It's, there are good people and there are even better people than the good people. There's better than better. There, there, I mean, there are different. Doesn't the, wrong, doesn't the wrong law address this issue? We talks about if we make up, we start to be extra pious. Whether we make up rules that aren't really Talmudic rules, and we're really making up things that aren't there, and that's not really really easy to do that. Oh, so we have a new friend. Okay, so the problem is the problem is that what you just said undermines about ninety eight percent of Orthodox Jewry. Ninety eight percent of our of our counterparts and colleagues in the religious world are inventors of all kinds of new laws. Absolutely, you're right. In this situation, what he's saying is there's a valid source for the other opinion, and you have the right to choose between both of them. And whereas your ordinary person can say, I want to follow this basic opinion, there is room for someone who says, listen, I keep 613 mitzvot. I'm, I'm the kind of person who, it's healthy for me to take the extra step. For some people it's not. There are people who are OCD and they use halakha to continue that, that problem. Uh, for me it's healthy. This is one of those situations in which I'm allowed to take on an extra obligation so does it mean that we're making a new law no we're stuck between two opinions clearly both of them are valid and we're saying you can rely on this one but in this situation you're allowed to also decide to be stringent like the other one but in general you're right no we can't just make up new things and we, we wouldn't support such a situation or, or a position that would make up new opinions says Rabbi David Yosef and if you go to bed after midnight, you can be lenient about getting dressed before washing your hands. Very simple. You don't have to be strict. 
if you go to sleep at 10 o'clock and halachic midnight is 1232 so then there's room to be strict and say I don't get dressed until I wash my hands but if you go to sleep after halachic midnight which would be 1233 or and on there's not even a reason to be stringent there tell me without knowing much what are you picking up in this halakha? Where is the prohibition of getting dressed coming from? What place? It has to do with one of the first things we learned about dividing the night into one. Okay, and brachot. So we're talking about pre-midnight and post-midnight. Right. What kind of terminology does it sound like to you? It seems to me like it's Kabbalistic in nature. Yeah. In Kabbalah, pre-midnight is a time of judgment, of klipot, deen, right, of all right. kinds of deen. I don't, I don't know what these terms mean, but I'm telling you what Kabbalah says about them. Post-midnight is still dark, it's still not beautiful outside, but it's not as bad. Not as bad. It's interesting, uh, from the Chinese science perspective, the time up to midnight is when the yin or the dark element dominates at midnight beyond is already returning even though it's six hours before the sun comes up interesting okay so in Judaism we we gave birth to that concept and then saying that right. night is night but we're still opening up the door to yeah, after midnight you're opening up the door to, to a good time. time and therefore according to us our little Mekubalim maybe you, when you go to sleep before Chatzot before midnight you have some kind of impurity on you and you don't want to touch the clothes that you're dating dressed on in that morning but if you go to sleep after midnight, anyways, you went to sleep at a better time of night, and you don't really pass that, that impurity on to your clothing. It seems to be that in any case, you don't have to be strict in this regard. But even if you were to be, you don't have to be after midnight. Only before. Let's go to some more halachot that we may understand better. Page 54, at the top of the page. Gimel. Ah. Those people who have water buckets next to their beds. Let me tell you why this frustrated me. Because for the first two years in Yeshiva, I refused. I refused to do this thing of washing my hands next to my bed. I didn't see it at home. My parents didn't do it. I don't know. Uh, I didn't know much, but it just wasn't for me. Somewhere around the 11th grade, one of my roommates... To drive me nuts. How can you not do it? You're already three years in yeshiva. And isn't this time for you to wash your hands? Okay. I did what he said. I went to the Judaica store. I bought myself a nice little bowl. A little cup that fit in the middle. Today I see they have lids for the cup. But then, you know, we, we used to put it on the floor and it didn't have a lid. Every morning I would wake up and I would step on it. <laughs> <laughs> and I would spill the water all over the floor. And you know it's like at 7 o'clock in the morning, oh, yeah. it's snowing outside. I'm from California, I don't even want to go to Yeshiva today. Like, it's, it's enough. Now I have to clean up the floor that's wet and still make it on time to Shacharit. One day, two days, three days, you clearly don't want me to keep this mitzvah. I'm done with it. I threw it out the window, and I have not washed my hands next to my bed since then. And when I got married, interestingly enough, so my wife, I see her at night, she has a bowl with a cup. And I told her that if she wants, she could do that in the other room. But I have bad experiences with water and bowls. Not for me. But uh, this was an interesting thing. Why is it that some people do it and other people do not? When my rabbi, Rav Peretz, came from Israel to my wedding, I was setting up his bed for him at night. And I asked him, Rav, should I get you a bowl of water and uh, a cup? I mean, I might as well have asked him if he wanted to pray shachrit at a church. Like, he, he, looked at me, he looked at me like I was crazy. Like, why would I need a water? And I, like, well, where do you come from? So I'll tell you where it comes from. Ledat Zara Kadosh, according to the Holy Zahar. You see that? By Gimel? See, Ledat, according to Hazar HaKadosh, the Holy Zohar, the Rabotenu HaMekubalim, and our Rabbi is the Kabbalists. Yesh li Zahar, one should be careful. Shelo lalechet, not to walk. Arba amot, four amot, how much did we say that was? Six Each amma is 18 inches? Six feet. Six feet? Six. Not to walk six feet. Baboker, in the morning, kodem she told yadav, before he washes his hands. I have to get out of tape measure. <laughs> 
my general assumption is that each one of these is an amma, about each block in the roof. So you can't walk four of them. Is that six feet? Am I doing? Maybe these are smaller. Those are those are like one, those are one and a quarter bigger than a, an amma. How many inches are these things? Twenty-four. They're twenty-four inches each. Oh, look! Somebody knows. I said I don't even know. So, less. How much of this would be a nama? Four ammo to be how many of these? Three of them. Yeah, three equals four. Okay, so three of these. Wonderful. I guess in Baltimore they were small. <laughs> three of these would count as four ammo. So how did you guys get to six feet? Two and no, four, six. Square. An amma is eighteen inches. One amma is eighteen inches. How many of these are in four amot? Three. three. So three of these are six feet. Okay, Baruch Hashem. So you are not allowed to walk according to the Mekubalim. Three of these, six feet. Without washing your hands. Now, what do you know about halachot that come from the Zohar and from the Kabbalists? Now, there's a very big rule. You must know this rule. This rule is written most famously in the writings of the many Mekubalim themselves. But let's quote one that we know: Rabbi Shalom Masas, who is the chief rabbi of Morocco. He writes in a number of his books, Tvot Shemesh, and again, in a number of his works, he quotes this halakha. In critique of the other Sephardic communities, such as the Iraqi Sephardic community, who pushed Kabbalistic observance on the masses, he says, Divrei Kabbalah, the words of the Kabbalah, lo ne'emru, were not said, ela la bilvad, only to the people who act their whole life according to Kabbalah. But your average Joe Shmo shouldn't be having Kabbalistic customs. So, you know, I wash my hands like the Zohar and I spend my afternoon in a, I don't know, co-ed gym. Wait until you fly in a magic carpet and then you could start keeping halakhot of Kabbalah. Rabbi Masas was very angry about this whole concept of people who were not Kabbalists following Kabbalistic customs. Said, we have a Shulchan Aruch. We have to have order in Judaism. Judaism says, Law halakha is halakha. Kabbalah is Kabbalah. If you're a Kabbalist, I'm not telling you what to do. But for us, as people who follow halakhot, we don't have to do things that are Kabbalistic in nature. You know, the Benish Chai very much disagreed with this approach. Hence the Benish Chai being the studied work among Iraqi Jews and not among Moroccan Jews. The Benish Chai writes that Kabbalah has already reached a time where the masses should begin to follow Kabbalistic observance to the point where both in Sephardic communities and in Ashkenazi communities, first Sephardim, whatever Kabbalistic things the Benish Chai said you're allowed to do, the Sfaradim do, even if they don't know what's, what it means. And by the Ashkenazim, whatever Kabbalistic things the Mishnah Bura, the Chavetz Chaim says you should do, they do, even if they're not Kabbalists. According to the Moroccans, this approach has no room in Halakha, but they clearly lost the battle. Today the world of Kabbalah is very enticing, and I'm not telling you that it's a bad thing, or a good thing, just something to be aware of, that not all of our rabbis agree to this approach. But the rabbis in the Kabbalah say if you are a Kabbalist or if you want to follow a Kabbalistic opinion, you don't walk more than four amot without washing your hands. But it's very important when we note the sources of things. The sources of washing our hands yesterday, where do they come from? Well, give me the names. The, the Zohar was one of them, but what else? Talmud. The Talmud. It's about 2,000 years old. Who else? Rishonim. All of them were Rishonim. The Rosh, the Rabbeinu Asher, this is Germany. In the times of the Tosafot, you're talking about the Rashba, Rabbi Shlomo ben Aderet, again, thousands of years ago. You're talking about Rabbi David Abu Raham. This is, again, one of the Rishonim. This is old, old people. And when you look at the origin of this custom, you'll find that the source of it, aside from in the Zohar, but in halachic literature, is not found. Do, do this with me. Follow that Dalit. You see that Rashi Dalit script that we just passed? Follow it into the Shar HaTzion on the lift. You see the Dalit on the top? Yeah. The Rashi Dalit, you see that? Oh, oh. At the end of where I finished reading. Yeah, I was looking Follow that Dalit down. You see where it is on the left hand side? Mm -hmm. He gives you the source. The source in Halakha, the first Halachic rabbi who said you must observe this stringency of not walking four amot 
without washing your hands. There he has the Bach. The Bach was written, the Beit Chadash, Rabbi Yoel Circus. Anyone heard of him before? The famous giant of Ashkenaz. He was actually Rabbi Shlomo Kalbach's great, 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 great grandfather. The Bach was one of the Hasidic rabbis who wrote a commentary on the Beit Yosef and the Torah. I Meaning he's it's a classic work, but not so old. At most 300 years old. I quoted Rabbi Yoel Circus, of those of you who read my book, you want to know where? Extra credit? The laws of Yashan. Oh. He's there is trying to justify why people don't keep Yashan. So I quoted him there. The Bach in the name of the Sefer Tolat Yaakov. The Tolat Yaakov, I don't know who wrote it. If I had to guess, no, give me a second. If I had to guess, it's not more than 400 years old. Let's check. Rabbi Google. Hmm. Tolat Yaakov. Okay. 1507. It's not so new. It's not so old either. 1507. There's a Sephardic Kuban in Constantinople. He's the first source to say that you shouldn't walk four amot without washing your hands. The Bach is the first famous source to tell us that. And then he says, V'hiviu in the Halakha, and he, they brought this down the Halakha, Achronim Rabim. Many, many, many of the later authorities. But it has no source in the earlier sources of Halakha. So you have to weigh this opinion as an ancient opinion that only caught on in popularity at most 500 years ago. I don't understand what you're saying. The source is the Zohar. The Zohar. Tonight. But the first time we find it in Halakha... Versus what? I mean, the Beit Yosef was also... So what, All what other of, source of Halakha would be... You would find it in the Rosh, you would find it in the Rambam, you would find it in, in one of our mm-hmm. works of Halakha. Sure, it's not such an old... Compared to the other sources that we've been learning, it's not such an old source. Especially if you could tell me how many Halakhot, like the Tolat Yaakov, you follow. This one? I'm not being Mizazel on the Tolat Yaakov, but how many... How many times do you hear that name in Halakha? Oh, that we do everything like the Tolat Yaakov. I mean, if the Rambam didn't codify this into his Halakhot, or the, or the Rosh didn't bring this down in the Halakha, or, or the Rif didn't write... So, Mehecha who says that now, because it's in the Zohar, the Zohar says a lot of things a person should do. This is something that only caught popularity 500 years ago, 400 years ago, 300 years ago, when the Bach wrote his book. And today, okay, the majority are telling you to do it but it's not as old of a halakha as many of the other ones. I'm not taking away from its importance, just from its weight. Okay, let's see what he says. Let's go back up. And if the water were rechokim, what does that mean? Far away, very nice. Meaning if your sink is far away from your bed. Yelech pachot pachot mi'ar ba'amot. You should walk tiny little steps so that you never take a step that's bigger. Uh, you shouldn't take big steps. Take small, small, small steps until you get to the sink. Klomar, meaning, Yilech pachot me'ar ba'amot. You should walk less than four amot at a time. V'yishemat, you should pause. V'shuv yilech pachot me'ar ba'amot. And then you should walk again less than four amot. Vishemat, and you should pause. Vichen and so on and so forth. Ad lamaim until you reach the water. So it turns out the reason why people have water by their beds, because if not, they would create a traffic jam on the way to the bathroom. And uh, therefore they prefer to have water by their beds. But it says in the corner of the Zohar, it seems to be that walking less than four amot at a time is better than walking four amot to make it to the sink. So the question is, why don't so many people do that today? Why don't most people have water by their bed? 
seems to be the Zohar takes this idea very seriously. So are Kabbalists. So we have to find the reason. Let's look inside. V'yesh Omrim, there are some who say, in the middle of uh, 54. V'yesh Omrim, you see that? It's a new paragraph. Oh, so you're, oh here we go. Oh. Everyone see where we are? Yeah, just I didn't know where you were before. No, okay, good. It's Horrible. five lines down from the Halachabra. V'yesh Omrim, there are some who say, this is the Shilot V'chuvot Shavut Yaakov. He says, Shebetoch Abay, the inside of a house, you don't have to be so strict about this. because the entire house nechshav is considered amot, like four amot. Guys, tell me the first time we heard of this halacha. No. No. No, none of the bunim talking about in the bathroom. I know we were talking about. Like if you're going to the toilet and you should have the door closed. However, we didn't talk about the whole house being a closed thing, so you still said you should close the bathroom door. Keep them. No. Tell me, guys, go with me to page 31. Page 31 at the top of the page. We know that you have to wear a kippah. And here we said, We are accustomed to be strict about this. Whether you are outside of your house, in the open air, or whether you are inside of your house, you also there have to wear a kippah. The assumption there was that maybe your house is considered a private domain and it's like you always have your head covered. Because there's a roof above your head, and your house is like one big four amot. That which it says four amot is speaking outside of your house, not inside of your house. If you were to be sleeping in a tent, and your tilat yadayim water is at the lake, and you have to walk from your tent to the lake, so it could be that that's where you're not allowed to walk four amot. But inside of one house or one building, all of that would be considered four amot, and therefore that's the first reason we found. That's why many people just walk simply to the sink to do anything that to them. Who is Halakhic source for this idea? Shavut Yaakov is his name. The Shavut Yaakov. Although by Kippah we had many more authorities who discussed this. The Marsha we had, there are a number of people that spoke about this. Okay, let's go to the next thing. V'yesh Cholkim, and some argue. Wonderful. You didn't think that was going to happen, right? V'yesh <laughs> Cholkim, this is the El Yerama. V'yesh ma'achronim, and some of the achronim, the levush is one of them, she'sovrim that are of the opinion she'mi'ikar adin, that from the basic halakha, mutar lelechet arba amot, you're allowed to walk four amot, kodem netilat yedayim shacharit, before you wash your hands in the morning. Okay? So what does this opinion say? That you can walk. Why? He doesn't say. Think about it. Yeah. We were just talking about it. What do you mean? The Zohar says you can't do it. So who says you can do it? The Achronim, right? But they have to be basing themselves on something. This question was once asked Rabbi Shlomo Aviner. And Rabbi Aviner answered, If somebody's not found in the Talmud, and it's not found in the Rambam, it's not found in Shulchan Aruch, but it is found in other sources. You should be aware that this is the definition of, according to Halakha, you don't have to do it. Because Halakha is the Talmud, the Rambam, and, the Zohar, and in the Shulchan Aruch. Everything else, you could follow those opinions, but you're not obligated to, at least not halakhically. And therefore, if the Rambam, the, the Shulchan Aruch, the Talmud doesn't tell us, you can't walk for Amot until you wash your hands, halakhically you can walk for Amot until you wash your hands. Does that make sense? <laughs> you could say no. <laughs> okay. So. Unless it's a mincha. 
What do you mean? Six feet. It's not that we are home. Why? What if your bed is far enough from the bathroom? Someone can walk all six feet in the house. No, that's according to one opinion. But if you don't agree with that opinion, so then you have to have a different justification for why you're walking to your sink. In this case, you would say, I follow the opinion of the one who says, it's not a halakha. It's not mentioned in the Shulchan Aruch. Maran doesn't say, he says you have to wash your hands in the morning. He doesn't tell us you can't walk for Amod. If it was important, he would have told us. I mean, one of the big problems with that is then what's the point of all the achron? I mean, if, uh, absolutely. If, if, if everything has to be, not, you know, befesh, in the Shulchan Aruch, I mean, not the Shulchan Aruch, or the Rambam, the Rambam then, then what's the point of all dissenting opinions in the achron? Nevertheless, uh, if we're saying that uh, the Gemara, the Rambam, the Shulchan Aruch, you know, I mean, you know, the Zohar is tonight, that's before the Gemara. So uh, you can't just say that that's, that's um, you know. And, and besides, you know, the whole idea of halacha is, you know, is olech, you know, you're going after something. So we have to believe that there's something new, you know, as things are redefined. There's something new that were never brought up in the Shulchan like Let's take, let's yes. take all three things. That I'm going to remember, try to remember. The first one was, if this is true, then what's the point of all the harni? Right? If, we don't see it in the if it's not clear in Shulchan so what's the point of everyone else spreading their own opinions? If that's what dictates Halakha, so why should I ever voice an opinion? The second point, the other good point also was... There's other things than even preceding the Gemara. Oh, the, the Zohar is not a little book, you know, it's a, it's a big deal. And the Zohar actually precedes the Talmud. It's from the times of the Mishnah. And the third question was... Help me out here. It was good. That was the best one of them all. You are things change. Ideas oh, on. things change. Halakha means that things change. There are things that the Chronim bring down that the Shulchan Aruch never even spoke about or didn't even write about or didn't discuss about. So let's take each one of those things at a time. The first one is, what's the point of the Chronim? This is going to be a vast difference in understanding. Probably between Svaradim and Ashkenazim. According to Svaradim, you're right. Chaunim have very little purpose aside from explaining the Shulchan Aruch, the Rambam, or the Talmud, or applying already existing halacha concepts in the Shulchan Aruch to modern day inventions, such as electricity or, or technology or anything else that would come up. But to come up with their own halachic opinions, mehechatet, who said you're allowed to? Not to come up with your own, but to, to, to have chidushim that are based on sources that even precede the Gemara. You know, right, that are not one of these three. <coughs> right, okay. Uh, Ashkenazim, though, and this is probably, probably, I was going to write it in this book, but I didn't want it to get put in Kharim before I ever printed it. Um, this is probably the biggest problem with codifying halakha for Ashkenazim. First, Faradim, you have some of us that are a little bit more Kabbalistically inclined, some that are a little bit rational inclined, some are more diehard Shulchan Ruchniks, and some are Rabbi Yovadi Yosef next, and some are Benish Chai next, but if you push Kams to Shav, you put everyone up against the wall, they agree on 99% of things, and the 1% they disagree on, they could work it out if they had to work it out between them. Because they all agree that the Shulchan Aruch and the Rambam are the only two halachic works that really matter. According to Ashkenazim, and by the way, by the way, it's a good thing, Sfaradim, unfortunately, because of our approach on halacha, are not very creative when it comes to halachot. We lack, we have a little bit of our hands tied. If the Shulchan Aruch says no, or the Rambam says no, so there could be brilliant opinions that disagree, and we're pretty much stuck. And we're in a situation where we say, go ask the other rabbi, he'll have a better answer for you. And it's unfortunate, because what it's done is cut down creativity on our side. The, the, the leeway that Ashkenazi authorities have by saying, even though the Shulchan Aruch said no, there's somebody else who said yes, and okay, it doesn't make a difference right now, we're going to help in this situation to follow this opinion. We don't have, unfortunately, we don't have that leeway. But fortunately, what it does do for us is, if you look at the world of Ashkenaz, I don't know that you can find three rabbis who agree on anything in Halakhot. Because they're not obligated to listen to Shulchan Aruch, and they're not obligated to listen to the Rambam, and they're not obligated to listen to anybody except for the opinions that they find fitting with their approach. And what that does is it makes it very hard to, to come to a conclusion as to what is Halakha and what is not. It's my and, shita or it's not my shita. Right, no, your, your Rav Shita and his Rav Shita and the third Rav Shita and... And you never come to a... So who are you obligated to follow? I remember I was arguing with my brother-in-law when I did publish my book. So my brother-in-law called me up. How could you say this? 
I said, but it's in the Shulchan Aruch. Who, who agrees with the Shulchan Aruch regarding this? I said, see, that's your problem. Is that who are you obligated to listen to? Who do you have to listen to? So I'm not, I'm not pasling, I'm not nullifying this approach to Hanukkah. But this question comes from an understanding of, so what good are the other opinions? For us, they're only good when it comes to clarifying Rambam or Shulchan Aruch or the Talmud. Not for coming up with their own chidushim that would contradict that. For us, when we hear such a thing, I remember once came to Rabbi Peretz. I said, Rabbi, Rav Moshe Feinstein has this brilliant chidush. It's an incredible, I think he's right. I think he's right. Can I rely on Rav Moshe Feinstein? And Rav Peretz told me, he said, you're asking me the wrong question. So the question isn't, can you rely on Rav Moshe? What kind of question? Rav Moshe Feinstein is a big person. But you have to ask yourself, in this halakha, is he agreeing with Rabbi Yosef Karo? Or is he disagreeing with Rabbi Yosef Karo? Could you fit what he's saying into Rabbi Yosef Karo? If so, then you can listen to him, because all he's doing is explaining a situation that already exists now that Maran would have applied his logic to. But if what he's saying directly contradicts the logic of Rabbi Yosef Karo, so it doesn't make a difference who said it. We're not talking about directly contradicting, we're talking about where he's silent. You know, you know where the Machaber is silent, and we don't know why. Right? So there are people who come and say they're Achronim, they're basing it on, 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 on Makor. Other the, people. The, the, not just other okay. people, on, on Tanaim. You know, just because the, you know, the, 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 the is uh, is silent and that, that, that invalidates the opinions. It doesn't invalidate. It makes us have the liberty to question whether we have to accept it. Mm-hmm. Yes. It doesn't invalidate it. Not automatically. But it gives us the liberty to say we don't need to follow it. The third question, and that was probably the best question, or the second question, was? Second. Second question. Very nice. The Zohar is a very old work. It's before the Talmud. So putting aside the, the historical questions that come up with the Zohar, who wrote it, did it write it, is it a... I'm not sticking my head here, I don't want to be an academic, I want to just think of it through the lens of Torah. Our rabbis, almost, unanimously, almost, there are exceptions to this rule, are under the assumption that Kabbalah never contradicts the Talmud. And when it does, we don't listen to the Zohar, we listen to the Talmud, even though the Talmud is, is a later source than the Zohar, if you assume the Zohar is a Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, it is the work of one rabbi, it's the work of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. And therefore, when Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai argues with Hillel and Shammai and, and Rabbi Meir and, and all, all the other Tanaim, he's still, as holy as he was, one opinion. And therefore, when the Zohar argues with the Talmud, or the Zohar adds something the Talmud didn't feel important enough to mention, so we could say, fine, I want to be stringent and take upon Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai's approach. Or you have the liberty to say, wonderful, if you're the kind of person who you live your whole life by Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, that's what you should do. But other people who follow the majority, who follow the Talmud, I don't have an obligation to follow one opinion over the ten that didn't mention it. Additionally, it's a tricky field. When the Zohar says something, does the Zohar actually mean that you should practically follow what it's telling you? The most common example is the difference between, again, it's always going to boil down to this, the Sephardic Kabbalists and the Ashkenazi Kabbalists. And the Sephardic Kabbalists viewed the Zohar to be a work of halakha almost. When it says something, if he says put three drops of water into your wine, that's what you're going to do. The Ashkenazim didn't study Zohar as a halakhic work, not so much. You found famous Kabbalistic masters in Ashkenaz that didn't follow Kabbalistic custom. Rather, for them, the Kabbalah was all, it was very philosophical, very theological, very, when it says put three drops of water in your wine, not necessarily does it mean water, not necessarily does it mean wine, it means all kinds of things that I don't, I don't purport to even begin to understand. And therefore, you'll find already there, is the Zohar actually telling you to do something? Some would say not. Just because it says to do something doesn't mean not. It means much deeper things than you and I could ever come to assume. And therefore, the Zohar, we're not arguing with the Zohar, rather, I'm not going to pretend to understand the Zohar, and when I have the highway, which is the Talmud, or the Rambam, and the Shulchan Aruch, so if you want to go like the Zohar, we said, you can do it, Tavala Abrachai is a, what do you say, praiseworthy to do so. But to demand for me to do so, not, not, the Zohar doesn't carry the demand, the obligation. And the last question was, what was the last question? Halakha is changing. Oh, Halakha is changing. This is a dangerous halakha. This is very dangerous. And this ties directly back into the lack of creativity in the Sephardic world and the creativity that could exist in the Ashkenazi world, which sometimes doesn't. But sure, halachot change. And halachot 
adapt to different circumstances. But for me to say, the things come up that Maran didn't do, that I'm going to do, it's a tricky concept. If my kitchen is going to be more kosher than the Rambam's kitchen, I better have a really good reason for doing that. I better have a really good reason for me today, in a generation of people who barely manage to keep halachot, that's what we are, barely, barely keeping our head above the water, mm-hmm. to say, you know what, the Rambam, uh, he would have eaten this food, I'm not going to eat it though. Sure, halachot evolved, but it's a little bit of, of gava, a little bit of ego to say, I could have one up the people who came before me. Sure, halacha does have, we can't get stuck somewhere and say, oh, you know what, they didn't do it, so we didn't do it either. But at a certain point, we get to dangerous territory of you know, the Rambam would come back today or, or the Rosh would come back today or Rashi would come back today and we wouldn't be willing to have Shabbat lunch in his house because he doesn't really keep kosher. <laughs> That's great. You have to be, be aware. There's probably like, a lot of people that wouldn't do that, right? Like the Baal Shem Tov would come back to the Hasidic community oh, yeah. and you know what would happen? They would stone him to death mm-hmm. because the Baal Shem Tov was, forgive me Baal Shem Tov for saying something about him, the Baal Shem Tov was a revolutionary was free hippie. Yeah. That's what he was. He was a person who, who broke every rule in the book. And, and Hasidim today are the biggest enforcers of rules in the book. In their communities, you can't break a rule in the book. And so, I, I sometimes, it's not me, it's not my own approach, but the question is, can I really be holier than those who came before me? And if the answer is true, I, I'll tell you one more quick story. You know, uh, sifting your flour for worms. Anybody do that? Just, just, just yesterday. Just yesterday? Did you find anything? <laughs> no. There's some people have a custom that before they use flour, they sift the flour for worms. Now, in a situation where your flour mostly has worms in it, it's a halakhic obligation. Uh, there are countries in the world where every time you sift your flour, you're going to find bugs in there. And therefore, before people bake, they sift their flour for worms. The vast majority of countries in the world, the vast majority of flour that we use, at least in civilized countries, don't have bugs in it. And uh, you actually won't find in our earlier customs, right? if you would ask your great-grandparents, everybody, you're all from different countries, before you baked challah, did you sift your flour? They would tell you no. No. And so when the Badats in Israel, one of the country agencies, put out a halakha saying that you must sift your flour, in a bakery that doesn't sift their flour, you can't eat their food, Rabbi parents went to have a meeting with the head of the Badats. And to which the head of the Badat said something very right. Said, why not, though? If I have a cash agency, why not enforce that people should sift their flour? Maybe once they'll find a bug and I'll save the whole Jewish community. And our parents said, I'll tell you why not. Because most of the halakhot we do today are why not, why not, why not. Why not do it? Why not have two of this? Why not have five of that? Why, why not? The answer is why not. He said, how could you live today and say that you're holier than your grandfather was? That's a good reason why not. There was a teacher who called it spiritual materialism. Interesting. <laughs> you know, the, the, Talmud, the Talmud has such a story. Rava, I believe it was Rava, was walking with a whole group of rabbis in, in a field. And he saw, maybe his name is Rabbi Huda Ben Bava, don't catch me on it. I want to tell you this is the story, almost. He saw this guy on the side, wouldn't walk in the field. He was jumping from stone to stone to stone to stone to stone. He says, who's this crazy guy over there? Please call him over. He calls him over. He says, what are you doing? Says, you know, I didn't want to walk in the field. Maybe there's bones, bodies. I, I didn't want to become impure. And he says, who are you? He said, I'm Rabbi Yehuda. He said, oh, you're the famous Rabbi Yehuda. He said, yeah. I said, if you weren't Rabbi Yehuda, I would excommunicate you in front of every, all the rabbis here. And he said, why? He said, because when all of the rabbis of Israel walk through this field, and you decide you're too holy, and you jump on the stones, you're worthy of excommunication. This concept in Halakha is an important one. Which is, if Chachmei Yisrael are walking here, and so you find somebody, he's jumping over there. So if he's worthy enough to jump on this, if he was Rabbi Yehudim Vava, if he's a follower of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai in all of his life, so he has the right to jump on stones. But the rest of us, or may, maybe you, but the rest of us, we have an obligation to walk with Chachmei Yisrael. We have an obligation to walk with them on the road that they walk. And the road that they walk is, they can walk through a field. They're not worried about such things. Good questions. I don't know if the answers were as good, but the questions were going to have questions. Those are in Yisadot. More than you're going to get halachot, it's more important to get principles of halacha. The principles are important. So to our, our discussion...
the Zohar is, is a valid source. The question is, how binding is it on me? So there's that opinion that says that one house is the same as one big four amot. Let's see the next opinion. Some say, and there's a number of, of sources that say this, that nowadays, in Ruach Ra'a, the evil spirit is not so mitsuya found among us. You don't really have evil spirit floating around us so much. That's not a good thing, by the way. It might sound like a good thing, but it's not a good thing. Because there's less potential for Very nice. According to Judaism, wherever you have more potential for holiness, there you have evil. So if we don't have so much evil flooding around, that's because we're not so potent for good. That's, that's what it, it's not a good thing, but practically it comes out better for us. It's like the whole thing of the Yetzirah for idols, which is much less now. Than it was then, because then they were also holier people. Right. Yeah, okay. Therefore, you don't have to be so strict about this. This opinion says, listen, there's not so much ruach ra'ah floating around on your heads. How do they, of course, measure how much? Right, so, again, how do you measure ruach ra'ah? I trust the people who are saying that they know how to measure it, to measure it. I don't know how to measure ruach ra'ah. <laughs> says Rabbi David Yosef, in a place of need, one can rely... And all of these above opinions to be lenient. The kol sheken, how much more so? If he goes to sleep after midnight, if he goes to sleep after midnight, then of course he has on who to rely to get dressed before, before, washing his hands. Before he goes to sleep. Tell me what Rabbi David Yosef just did. In the beginning he said it's okay. Now he's telling me that in a time of great need I can rely on these opinions. What happened here? Mm, maybe, maybe because back in the olden days he should have been strict, but now where we're at we're not as holy, so it's better to be lenient. Well, he doesn't say that, but I hear what you're saying. It's more circumstantial where if you find yourself, you said earlier, in it in a tent where you have to walk to a lake, or you have different situations that may come up with washing your hands in the morning, so you can choose what's going to be appropriate for your situation. Okay, so let, me, let me ask both of you. According to the first time when he's told us the halacha, according to the halacha, you don't have to worry about it. If you want to be praiseworthy, you can. What would my assumption be? If I went home, what would I do tomorrow morning? Praiseworthy. Uh, mm, I don't know. I, would, I wouldn't wash my hands. I would go to the sink. I want to wash my hands next Your to my house bed. Is for <laughs> but now he quotes the Zohar and the Kabbalists, and then says, "In the time of great need, you can rely on the opinions who disagree." What would I do now if I would go home tomorrow morning? Is my normal morning a time of great need? I don't think so. I don't think so. So which is the right halacha? The first one and the second one. First one. What if a person, of course, is, is, dis, has disability and can't make it? To us? Oh, so obviously, so this would yeah. be a classic situation. It could be that Rabbi David Yosef has a certain feeling in his heart like Eric, which is the Zohar is a big deal. And so, before we read about the Zohar, obviously halakha is halakha. But after we read about the Zohar, why not take the Zohar into consideration if you can? Unless you can't. And if you can't, okay, so you have a hood rely on. Do you agree with my assessment of the situation? In the first halakha, he didn't yet quote the Zohar. He just told us, according to halakha, you don't have to. And if you want to, you could. And now all he's doing is telling you why it's a good thing to be strict. Why is it a praiseworthy thing? Because the Zohar men quotes it. And then he recaps the halakha and says, why not follow the Zohar? Unless there's a reason not to. Do you agree with me? Do you not agree with me? Looking at me, it's okay. It's okay. He's Who doesn't agree with me? He's not saying you can't do it. So okay, he's giving. Okay, he's definitely saying you can do it. There have been some situations that don't do. Don't do this. this. So Would Rabbi Shalom Masas agree with this halacha conclusion? The one who says that Kabbalistic things are only for Kabbalists. Would he agree with Rabbi David Yosef's conclusion? No. No. No, probably not, because. We're not, maybe you are, right? We're not capitalists. And therefore, 
Rabbi David Yosef is going on the assumption that you're allowed to follow something from the Zohar, so long as it doesn't contradict Halakha. And why not do it if you can? It's very easy. It Keep would, some water next to your bed. It would seem that the realm of the Zohar Kabbalah, what I've been seeing so far, the trend is that it's more of an individual choice than a group one. Sure. So it's like, you have, today you have groups of people, like you were saying at the beginning, got to go to the mikvah in the morning before you go to the Beit Knesset. But perhaps in terms of the, per, the tzniyut of piety, if a person went and quietly, that would be more permissible than saying, okay, this is a group and we do it. It's, 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 I think it's, it's, I seem to feel a trend that he supports more of a private tzniyut version of more stringencies than... Not a public version. Doing, you know. Okay, could be he picked this up from his father, Rabbi Vadi Yosef, who very much was a Kabbalist and in his personal life did things according to Kabbalah, but in his halachic works didn't allow people to do so. So is he a hypocrite? No. He writes in his Chazor of Adiyah, in the laws of Pesach, he has a section called Hilchot Mitzlachei Mazon, the laws of, of food, uh, you know, buying food. He writes there at the end that when a, a rabbi gives a Pesach Halacha, it must be according to Halacha. And even if he himself is stringent, he's not allowed to pass on his stringent opinion to the person who's asking him the question. Rather, he wants to be strict in his own house. And outside of his house, to other people who ask him a question, he should answer them the way that the halakha would be followed in a normal, conventional setting. And it could be Rabbi David Yosef is setting this up also. That in a group setting, you're right. You don't have to. On an individual level, why not follow the Zohar if you can? I don't want to stick my head between Rabbi Masas and the Rabbi Yosef's family. Um, but what can I say? I'm half Moroccan. I like that. I like that side of me a little bit. So, uh, Rabbi Shalom Masas in my book takes a little bit more credibility. But either way, if you want to keep water next to your bed, and if you don't want, you have a number of opinions to rely on, and Matovu uh, Manaim to do such a thing. All right, it's good as well. Uh, I know it's it's much later. You can choose any opinion. In certain situations, you can right because they're both valid. Yeah, they're both valid. Educated enough.